paper I'm presenting today is part of a broader project dealing with the circulation of images on the web. And I'm working currently on different case studies. And the one I'm going to present today started um, a year ago with uh, an invitation to a panel that was dealing with militancy and images. So I started working with um, an archive of the student strike in Quebec, the 2012 student strike. And it developed into an extended paper, uh, which is the one I'm going to present today, that uh, uh, will be submitted to A Modern, which is a, an open access journal based in Montreal. Um, so your comments and suggestions uh, will, help, will be helpful to improve the final version of, of this paper. So I'm happy to present it here today. Um, so this project deals with the circulation of steel images online, and it begins with a very simple question, which is, when we publish an image on the web, where does it go? What do people do with it? How does it navigate the different territories of online websites? Um, what are these trajectories along data streams? Um, this question, this simple question, raises a lot of methodological issues and ethical issues. And especially when you research on sensitive topics, such as social movements. Um, because in this case, in some cases, anonymity is at stake. So if you research extensively where do images come from and what do people do with it, you might encounter some information that raise ethical questions. Um, so to illustrate how these activity logs can uh, carry sensitive information, I'm going to start with an anecdote. You may be familiar with, um, oh, that's an example of activity logs. Um, so the anecdote, you may be familiar with John McAfee, um, millionaire software, uh, software millionaire turned semi-fugitive after he was accused of killing his neighbor in Belize. In 2012, Vice magazine published a story titled We Are With John McAfee Right Now, Suckers, um, that included a photo of him with Vice uh, Editor-in-Chief. On the same day, Wired, the online magazine, reported a problem. Um, this picture was taken with an iPhone 4S, and like many smartphones, the iPhone 4S automatically embeds geodata in the picture unless the setting is turned off. So um, the geodata in this picture was pointing to a swimming pool in Guatemala, <laughs> more precisely in a hotel called Rancho Mary. So basically, Vice gave away the fugitive by bragging about finding him. Um, as shown in this anecdote, when we publish images online, we are not always aware of the potentially hidden data that we send along with these pictures. Embedded metadata is a set of administrative, technical, and um, descriptive information that is um, uh, unknowingly um, traveling within the files. And what's interesting for me is that they provide context on the uh, conditions of creation, use, and circulation of the images. In a paper titled uh, Counter Forensic and Photography, Thomas Keenan made the following comment, inspired by the photography critic Alan Sekula. He <coughs> said, because there is a trace, there is a battle. Around the image, a debate can begin. We decide what it says. It does not. It cannot. This is what the word evidence means. Everything beyond the imprinting of a trace <coughs> is up for grabs. The word trace is interesting here because in Secular's words, it refers to the indexicality of photography. That is to say, the direct physical connection of the object that imprinted its shape on the photosensitive surface. And Keenan associates this notion of trace with that of evidence. Uh, and the shift he makes is twofold. On the one hand, he contrasts the ambiguity of meaning with the uh, obvious physicality of the trace. And on the other hand, he brings forward the forensic perspective, where traces are clues. They are marks that were left behind um, and that can be collected for legal. 
So embedded metadata are a kind of digital footprint. They record events and like all data, they are physically inscribed in some kind of surface, either in the form form of magnetic polarities on hard drives or as electric charges on flash memory cards. So if the, if the meaning of images is a contested territory where interpretation clash, interpretations clash, image metadata analysis opens another battlefield, which is that of the exploitation of informational traces underneath visual science. In this sense, um, embedded metadata analysis sets the stage for an economic, political, and ethical debate around this idea that um, digital traces are up for grabs for the researcher. The role of embedded metadata and their modes of exploitation are quite diverse. Uh, first, the machine readable format allows the interoperability of um, content across platforms. Media industries also use it for copyright management. Okay, I didn't know that until... For the heritage sector, um, embedded metadata is a tool to classify and organize information. And uh, Jose Van Dijk also analyzed the use of embedded metadata in the practices of amateur and professional photographs to classify their images on Flickr. Um, intelligence and prosecution also resort to them to track suspects and for uh, researchers interested in mapping the digital trajectories of content, this is very valuable information to uh, study the social life of images. So the recent literature in the field of media studies highlighted the part metadata plays in um, the informational infrastructure and in digital economies, uh, for example, Beer and Burroughs analyzed the role of metadata in the archiving of popular culture, especially in the music sector. But a few of these works focused especially on embedded metadata and its specificity in images. Um, and the literature is also lacking an, an ethical framework to help work with this uh, data, um, because there is a specificity um, specific ambiguity with embedded metadata, which is that it's both publicly accessible and partially invisible, which uh, is not easy to deal with in research methodologies. So to explore these issues, I'm proposing a case study uh, based on a series of photographs representing the Carré Rouge, the red square, uh, which is a visual form that became an iconic sign during the 2012 student strike in Quebec. And first, what I would like to do is to outline how contemporary, contemporary regimes of visuality poses new uh, challenges to social movements. Uh, because when activists post images online um, to document their political narratives, they have to negotiate the dialectics of empowerment and disciplinarization that is unfolding uh, in the digital media. So in uh, 2012, the wet square became an iconic sign for supporters of the Quebec student uprising. Students were protesting, protesting against um, an increase, 75% uh, increase in student fees. And this movement gathered uh, broad popular support when the government passed emergency laws that restricted the freedom of expression. For example, um, every group of more of 50 people and more in the street was considered a riot. And that was a way to try and stop the many, many, many protests that were happening every day. This movement, uh, known as the Printemps Érable, the Maple Spring, um, turned into the longest student strike in Quebec giving rise to the largest demonstrations in the history of the province and to the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history when this, um, when this law restricting the right to um, protest happened, hundreds and um, thousands of people came out in the streets in uh, contestation of this law. Going back to the visual form of the red square, 
its first iteration appeared in 2004 in a meeting uh, organized by the community organization Québec Sans Pauvreté, Québec Without Poverty. And it appeared in the form of a red tape um, put on clothes, taped on clothes. And quickly, this uh, sign was taken, taken up by student associations that created this uh, felt and pinned version that became uh, the iconic sign of the strike. Um, and it quickly proliferated um, and materialized on innumerable surfaces in the city, walls, knit, snow, and skin. So adding to this material history of the Red Square, I would like to examine its digital forms what can we learn from the web archives of the Red Square? I came across, looking for digital forms of this Red Square, I came across a very interesting repository built by a student named uh, David Wickington, uh, who studied, collected many digital artifacts at the intersection of online spaces of, of organizing and of archiving. His work started with collecting images on Facebook, um, searching in groups and pages where the movement was organized and then he moved this archive to another platform he moved it to Flickr and then from Flickr he moved it to another platform or he created another platform which is a website called um, Arctic Artifacts of uh, Quebecois Spring So when you look at the movement of circulation and republication of these images across platforms, you quickly realize that by following the images, you can follow political acquaintances uh, between different militants and different groups. Retracing um, how these images were shared, for example, on Wikipedia, gives interesting results. This picture, um, uploaded to Wikimedia Commons was taken in the campus of Université de Montréal in 2012 and it was reused later in the Wikipedia page um, uh, on the Cooper Union financial crisis and tuition protests where the symbol got associated with the clock tower. Uh, Wikipedia edits History of edits allows to find a user who posted this image on, on the page. And if you go to his user page, you can find a link to his website where, um, sorry, that's here, where there's lots of information, uh, including all of his social media identities, his Foursquare, Facebook, even his, his Tinder account. Uh, and there's also a link to a personal blog where he narrates, narrates his participation in the events and he names members of his activist network. So images are a strategic resource for social conflicts in all aspects, aspects of social conflicts. Information, mobilization, propaganda, but also uh, intelligence and prosecution. Photography and video, because of their optical realism, and their automated nature document and fuel social conflicts, but they make double-edged weapons. They are a powerful tool to raise awareness and to mobilize, but they are also evidence to track and prosecute uh, suspects. And Alan Sikula describes this ambiguity as a system of representation capable of functioning both honorifically and repressively. So photography, he argues, by producing material records of the public look, served to introduce the panoptical principle into social life. Looking back uh, in the history, the Paris Commune is known as one of the first insurrectional episodes to be photographed. And during the upheaval, the photographer Bruno Bracelet took group pictures of protesters, including this one, um, depicting a group of people standing next to the ruins of the Vendôme Column, which is a, a symbol of the Napoleonian Empire taken to the ground by the Comina. And these pictures were later used in the trial of uh, the French painter Gustave Courbet, 
Gustave Courbet was elected at the Commune in 1871, and he was accused of participating in the destruction of the Vendôme column. And using these pictures, um, the judge um, sentenced him to pay back integrally the damage caused to the column, which caused, caused his exile out of France. So today, Braqueray's pictures testify of the nascent use of photography as a tool for uh, in the judiciary apparatus. Now, back to uh, the present. Contemporary social movements unfold in a regime of visualty that is characterized by image proliferation and global uh, dissemination networks of images. The portability of um, cameras and their integration into smartphones, smartphones and other uh, mobile devices allow for a self-production of, con of content um, that is integrated into the everyday practices of activists and protesters. But the changing nature of power in social technical networks implies what Swift calls a new track and trace model. And it questions the mode of agency that um, develop in this context, because the forms of voice that social movements produce online is, are uh, profoundly entangled in a dialectic of surveillance and uh, recognition. Um, this can be observed in the practice of publicly posting photographs on social media, uh, intended as a resource of information for um, supporters, but also knowing that these resources are available to police forces for monitoring. So as a researcher, knowing that image file may carry hidden information, um, what are the methodological and ethical considerations we need to take into account when um, carrying, uh, carrying out such a research project? Um, in fact, as we would see, the risk of, of finding uh, sensitive information in images is very low, but still we need to assess these risks before or during um, uh, carrying on uh, such projects. Um, so to understand what may be at risk, uh, we need to examine in detail the material structure of digital images and understand better what, uh, what metadata is. So here is an example of um, an image in which fortunately I didn't find any hidden information. Um, okay, so broadly speaking, metadata is data about data. Uh, it's a layer of information that describes the attributes and structure of digital resources. And there are many kinds of metadata. For this talk today, I'm concentrating on document metadata. So document metadata, according to Ragavan, um, it informs on the context of how, when, who, and in what form the document was created or modified or accessed. Um, in the Sedona Principles, which is a resource of best practices for electronic document production, uh, it is mentioned that much metadata is neither created by or normally accessible to a regular user. This figure, this picture here on the left, uh, shows the limited subset of metadata, metadata information I can access on my Mac, and if I want to have the full a list of values, I need to run uh, a small program called Exif Tool through the terminal that allows to export and display all of the, all of the data. And uh, Exif Tool is a more advanced tool that many regular users would not be familiar with, right? Um, Exif Tool is, um, is a, an, open so an open source program created by Phil Harvey. Um, it allows to not only to retrieve and display metadata, but also to modify it, to edit it. And not only in uh, image documents, but also in video and text documents. Um, so while Active Tool normally requires to install the software on your computer, there are several services online that allow to display uh, metadata into, in uh, web browsers, including 
uh, fill, fill the RBAs on um, exit viewer service. Um, there's another website that I uh, used, which is called the Photo Forensics, and this one contains other tools, for example, error level analysis that allows to detect image forgery by revealing um, areas in the image that are at different levels of compression. So while, the, while these tools are designed for a specialist, uh, there are more popular applications that photographers can use. For example, um, Adobe Bridge or Lightroom, where you can edit uh, your metadata. And also the website Flickr that is designed primarily at professional photographers um, display a, a, an ex exhaustive list of metadata. But it's a, it's a, I would say it's a, an exception. Most uh, web platforms and social media do not uh, display this metadata. So what does embedded mean? Technically, it means that instead of having the descriptive information in a site called file, the two are um, placed in one same file, uh, which uh, um, saves the problem of having to connect the two files together and having the problems of disconnection as the file is moved to another uh, setting. Uh, when we look at the different image formats, the JPEG, TIFF, PNG, GIF, etc., they all have their own way of organizing the image data scheme and the metadata scheme. If we take the example of a JPEG file, um, it is composed of various segments that are separated by markers and typically the metadata is stored in the first and second of these segments in the header of the JPEG file. Um, and this is an example, an output example of a JPEG image file that contains EXIF and XMP metadata. You see here in the first and second segments mentioned EXIF, which is a type of metadata, and Adobe, which is a, um, another type of data that was added by uh, Photoshop software. Um, so there are many kinds, so there are many kinds of image formats, and even for one format like JPEG, there are many kinds of metadata formats. So I'm going to name four main formats, but there are many more. Um, the most popular, the most known, is EXIF. EXIF stands for Exchangeable Image File Format, and it was created by a camera uh, manufacturer um, or association of manufacturers, the Japan Electronics and Information Technology Industries Association of Data. Um, and what this type of metadata records is the the context of creation of an image. So the time of creation, the, that's where the geolocation is, um, the camera manufacturer, and sometimes you also get a unique ID number that is associated with your camera. Um, and you can also get um, uh, lightning conditions, so that could tell if the image was taken inside or outside. Uh, a second kind of metadata standard is the XMP, the Extendable Metadata Platform, that was created by Adobe system, uh, Systems. And this type of metadata records uh, modifications that were um, modifications that happened to the file after it was created. So here you have a whole history of modifications. So when was it modified? With what tool, whether it was Photoshop, with Lightroom, was it on the Mac or on the Windows? You don't know exactly what was done, but you have um, uh, sometimes um, the ID of the parent document. If the image you're looking at was derived from a document, you have that information. The third type is IPTC, International Press Telecommunications Council. That's the organization that developed this standard. And this one typically is used to embed copyright information, images. So you can have um, headline, byline, keywords, etc. And the last one I'm going to mention is uh, much more reduced in scope. It's called ICC Profiles. Um, it was created by the International Color Consortium. And what it does, well, it um, regulates the, well, the color profile of the image. 
but what's interesting here is that sometimes web platforms embed their own color profile into the image. For example, if you, when you upload an image on Facebook, Facebook will embed its own color profile and that mark will stay within the image. So if you find that image down the stream and you see profile copyright Facebook, you know that the image went through Facebook at some point. Um, so as um, Matt Kirschenbaum observes, all these values allow to record events, actions and processes that have occurred between the initial creation of the image and the changes or user system activities that happened uh, down the stream in and that testify of a specific digital ecosystem in which the image evolved. This transitional data um, may relate to ownership, to user interactions, to movements from one location to another, and as such, they are valuable information to analyze the spatial and temporal flows of digital images. So here is another example. Um, this is a photograph of red squares that were taped on statues in Montreal during the maple screen. And this is the output metadata uh, organized by categories. So what you see here in the exit section is the data creation, the geodesk data is here, GPS latitude and longitude. You also have um, thumbnails. So what's embedded in images is text, but not only text. You have an image, most of the time, an image embedded within the image is the thumbnail. And what's interesting is that sometimes the thumbnail can be different from the image you see on the screen. For example, if you um, took a portrait of yourself to put on a social media website, but you don't want to be recognized, you edit the image, you, blur, you cut it, or you blur something, right? Well, the thumbnail might retain the original image. <laughs> so if you expand the metadata, well, then the picture is not that anonymous right, anymore. So that can be a problem that many people are not aware of. Um, so you see here that there's a thumbnail in the exit. Um, in the activity scene, we see a very detailed description of the image with the byline, the name of the photographer, his city, um, copyright notice. So that, of course, is the sign that the author is a semi or professional photographer, right? That uh, masters the tool to automatically or semi-automatically embed uh, information in the images. Um, we see that the metadata was added one day after the image was taken on uh, June 1st, and it was added with uh, Lightroom, Photoshop Lightroom. Uh, we see the actions was converted from the raw image to a JPEG. Um, we have the date, we have the, uh, the original document ID, and then there's also the camera ID at the bottom. Um, other tools, other forensic tools uh, that focus on servers also allow to gather different information more related to user activity. So you could know uh, the IP address of someone who downloaded an image from the web, and you can also know how many times this image was downloaded. So um, now, even before we get to the ethical issues, there are important caveats that need to be addressed in uh, metadata analysis. Because um, inaccuracy and information loss is very common in uh, metadata. Uh, and this can lead to potential misinterpretation. Uh, and it is, it is difficult to evaluate the, the level of risk in each image. Is this one, is this information valid? Is this one valid? It's uh, hard to evaluate. And chances of error are especially high with timestamps. Um, so why? Well, first, because the initial settings of your camera may be wrong. You may have, may have the wrong time from the beginning, right? Uh, and then, when, the, when you travel across continents with your camera, most of the time, you don't change the, 
the time zone, right? So then the time is inaccurate, or, and you have no idea to make the correspondence between the universal time and the, your, uh, the time at your location. Um, a third problem, as, as the Sedona principle points out, is that when you move a file, even within your computer, from one location to another, that may change the timestamp, the, the date of creation. So that's another uh, risk of uh, misinterpretation. Um, okay, and fourth, that's the Sedona principle. Uh, and fourth, which is the one of the biggest problems, is that when you upload an image on most social media platforms like uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter, for example, most of the metadata is removed by these platforms. They may retain on, in their servers the original image that you uploaded, but what, what they display on the screen, what is available for download, is a thumbnail image, and they remove the metadata from this image. And in the case on Facebook, it's particularly interesting because um, while they remove this data, they ask you to recreate it, it on their platform, right? They ask you, when was this image taken? Where was it? Who was there? So they say we removed the metadata because of privacy issues. But then they ask you to give this information again. And the benefit for Facebook in this case is that uh, instead of having embedded metadata that travels with the file and that facilitates the migration of an archive from one website to another, well then the metadata, the descriptive information is captive on their platform. So if you want to move the archive of all your um, uh, travel pictures for, uh, for, from the last years, if you want to move it from Facebook to Flickr, you will have to recreate manually all of the descriptive information. And it might have been here before you put it on Facebook, right? Um, so um, here is a, a, a little um, analysis that I made on um, an album of red squares by, uh, created by David Whittington on the website I told you uh, earlier. So in this album, there were uh, 327 images, only 130 were photographs, the other ones were drawings, uh, so by a sense they do not hold exif, photographs have exif. And so on these uh, 130 images, only 7% had exif. For all the others, it had been removed. Uh, then I looked more closely at a small sample, small random sample of 25 images and in, that had exit. And in these images, I found uh, five with the date of creation and 20 with the mentioned profile of white Facebook. There's clearly a correlation here between the two facts. Because these images went through Facebook, most of the exit metadata was gone. Um, so, Studying more in depth these uh, dysfunctions in metadata handling is uh, maybe a, a good way to um, study the politics of platforms. Um, because um, if social media benefit from this metadata removal, well, for photographers, it's a big problem, right? Because you can't have your uh, copyright information or your descriptive information attached, staying attached. To your pictures. And uh, such a perspective could help also understand the, this broader dynamic of metadata accumulation and degradation in the movement of content online. When I started this uh, study, I thought that uh, the more an image circulates, the more it accumulates metadata. Right? So I thought oh, I'm going to find you know, all these marks that you know, pile up. And actually, I discovered that no, <laughs> it's actually it degrades. Some marks are left, like the Facebook uh, uh, color profile, while others are completely wiped out. So I found very interesting this complex dynamic of accumulation and degradation. Um, so now back to the track and trace model and uh, its ethical implication for research. 
Um, in the last year, there was um, a lot of uh, interest for digital traces, the topic of digital traces, and many interesting work uh, developed at the intersection between forensic analysis, archival science, and media studies, like, for example, Matt Kirchner's work. Um, and as researchers develop innovative methodologies to follow the trajectories of images, ethical debates arise. Uh, because um, what are the implications of using these unobtrusive methods that are based on the same track and trace model that surveillance operations and police investigation result to? Um, so as I said, the, in the sample, in the small sample study, uh, the small sample that I study, I didn't find any compromising information. But still, um, I was while I was doing it, I was um, uh, left with a discomfort, thinking, what would I do if I found something that I uh, that should not have been there, that someone left unintentionally, and that could compromise this person? And I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what I should do. Would it be ethical to use it? Can I use it for research? Can I publish uh, this information? Or is it, how is it framed in terms of ethics? And so these questions uh, um, continue to read a lot about uh, ethical, because there is a lot of things that are written about um, ethics in web, uh, web research. Um, and, um, and I realized how important it is to assess the power dynamics that are, that are at stake in, um, in the, the changing uses of forensic technologies and also its counter uses. So digital forensics uh, stands for law enforcement and uh, it's a French police investigator named Edmond Ricard who pioneered the field associated with trace evidence in the early uh, 20th century. And he was the one, one of the first to um, systematize the use of fingerprints. In uh, his book, Mechanisms, New Media and the Forensic Imagination, Matt Kirchenbaum uh, notes that computer forensics uh, developed or formalized as a professional specialization in the early 2000s and its most advanced forms were developed in um, federal agencies such as uh, the NSA and the FBI. Um, so image files, not only image files, but hard disks and storage uh, media hold the embodied inscriptions of uh, digital data that police investigators may extract in search of evidence. And uh, metadata analysis is commonly used in um, child exploitation, cyber extortion, uh, drug trafficking, and terrorist activity investigation. But it can also serve more controversial purposes like stalking, industrial espionage, political repression. And because cyber uh, tracking techniques are evolving very quickly, uh, they achieve great sophistication. So document metadata is one of the many digital records that are exploited by forensic investigation and can be matched with other kinds of traces. For example, um, the unique ID of your camera can be matched with credit card information and the list of equipment that you bought and it can help to both, uh, um, more broadly uh, monitor activity. Uh, in the documents leaked by Edward Snowden in 2013, um, there is a mention that um, the NSA is specifically targeting EXIF metadata in the XKIS core program, the Mass Global Surveillance Program. And the same year, The Guardian reported that um, a multinational security firm called uh, Raytheon has been working since 2010 with the US government to develop a technology named um, Rapid Information Overlay Technology and this uh, Google for Spies, as the Guardian calls it, um, mines social media and look for pictures that you posted on social media and look for the embedded metadata. Um, and that, uh, that helps uh, tracking people's movement. So the, um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, has on his website some mention of the risks associated with embedded metadata 
but uh, most of the time, while many uh, digital uh, literacy initiatives dealing with privacy, many of them fail to address the specific risks associated with embedded metadata. Um, there are tactical resources that are shared on the web about how to make your uh, images more private, and uh, these tutorials and resources are shared among all kinds of um, uh, groups, including criminal networks. Um, and terrorists, have, of course, terrorist groups uh, are, have learned to take increasing precautions in uh, the way they share content online. Uh, for example, this is um, an excerpt from a document named Digital Surveillance and Multimedia Metadata that was posted online by uh, supporters of uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in 2014. And it's a tutorial that um, explains how to remove metadata using um, Exif tool, which is always uh, the, the free software uh, tool. So um, as a conclusion uh, for the last section of my presentation, um, I will give a few insights on how to uh, potentially develop a more uh, exhaustive ethical framework to deal with these kinds of data. And this is actually the beginning of a new paper in which I would like to address more specifically uh, the different aspects of it. Um, so, uh, even if the risks are low, from a research ethics point of view, these risks need to be assessed. Uh, and we need to make sure that the people that are being studied uh, will not be harmed in any way. Um, and that, um, um, the context of it is the changing nature of hyper-connected networks and the changing agency of researchers that are equipped with new tools that allows or that changes the dynamic of power between the researcher and the person who is being studied. Um, Sensitive research was broadly defined by Raymond Lee as research which potentially poses a substantial threat to those who are or have been involved in, in, it, in the research. Um, and he lists three different kinds of threats. Uh, first, intrusive threat, threat sorry. Um, for example, intruding into the private sphere. Uh, the second one is the threat of sanction associated with social control and the risk of revealing deviant activities that could lead to uh, stigma or recrimination. And the third one is political threat, uh, such as purely and overtly conflictual situation and uh, making things, things worse or damaging relationship between third parties. Um, so to assess these uh, risks in uh, research projects, again, there are three main, main variables that need to be taken into account. The first one is the topic sensitivity, for example, uh, when you're researching on children or teenagers using internet or a social movement. The second one is the rapidly changing context of interaction on the web and the emerging possibilities of data capture. And the third one is the choice of research method that you implement in your research. Um, so in the field of movement studies, the um, the different types of uh, threats pointed out by me are all intertwined, but the, the risk of uh, threat of sanction uh, needs to be uh, specifically addressed. Uh, for Stefania Milan, there is a quote, there is a certain degree of risk associated with political dissent in authoritarian and democratic countries alike because of uh, disclosing uh, activist uh, dynamics might expose them to surveillance as well as oppression, jeopardizing their activities if not subjecting them to personal threats. Um, so, of course, the level of sensibility, sensitivity is different for each project, but the broad context in which the research happened uh, is another variable that uh, has to be taken into account. For uh, Judith Simon, we need to rethink the notion of epistemic responsibility uh, because it's changing. And uh, it's um, uh, uh, especially changing with the use of automated tools that allows researchers to scrape and data mine the web. 
and uh, it's not only the conditions of data collections that are evolving, but the status of researchers as empowered agents. Um, and so the, um, the agency of web researchers can be analyzed or characterized as a distributed assemblage of human and non-human actions, uh, in which compactants or computer interactions for a very, in which compactants play a growing role. And actually, internet user activity is constantly monitored by these compactants. Uh, here is a 2015 report showing that uh, almost half of websites visitors are non-human. And for small websites, this number raises to 85%. And uh, out of these non-human um, uh, visitors, a large number are malicious uh, bots like uh, scrapers, impersonators, uh, hacking tools, or spammers. Um, Caldery and Powell observe that the mutual intertwining of human and material agency is hardly a new insight, but it acquires a special interest when analytics operations are opaque to non-expert social actors who must work hard to acquire control over them. And um, that's specifically a problem in research ethics uh, when there is a distance between what Sweeter calls one actor's knowledge and will and the other actor's information and power. So much of these um, issues are still in the gray zone and there's no general recipe uh, that allows to create a one-fits-all uh, ethical framework. Um, but the literature on web ethics has been expanding since the 90s and um, especially at the Association of Internet Researchers. There was a, a committee working on web <coughs> research ethics that published several gu guidelines. Unfortunately, the, the committee has been dissolved, but the discussion continues in the annual conferences of uh, 